50 years ago on a small and almost unknown island in the far reaches of the vast western Pacific, thousands of miles from the mainland of the USA, epic events took place which culminated in two of the most important events of the 20th century, the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Captain Behan, the bombardier, says, I see it, I see it, I've got it. So the bomb run was relinquished to him. Hugh Ferguson, uh, uh, co-pilot, and I were wearing uh, welder's goggles, and we were flying away from the explosion, and still the uh, cockpit was lit up by this uh, tremendous flash of light. Within hours, headlines and wire services screamed the astounding news of these monumental events to the bewildered world. The result was complete astonishment. New York Times, AP, anybody you could think of, it was all news to them. It was a complete surprise. We almost at once were convinced that we had a new and enormously different weapon of a kind that never had existed before. This is the time new time starts. This is zero hours of a new world. Today I had a ringside seat at a moment in history. I guess I was happy because I thought, certainly now the war is going to end. I mean, no one's going to put up with this. You can't. Life for all mankind had changed in a fundamental and profound way on those August days in 1945, with thunder and fire. This is the story of that thunder. A thunder from Tinian. Standing on the beautiful but restless shoreline of the island of Tinian today, one is somehow aware that events of mythic proportions once took place here. You are surrounded by a strange and powerful energy. Mountainous waves slam into the jagged coral shoreline, just below the runways where thousands of B-29s once rose into the sky with bomb bays full of fiery death. Over this shoreline, the B-29s Enola Gay and Boxcar rose into the August 1945 skies bearing the most destructive forces in the universe. Here, below the churning waves, lie the fragments of many shattered B-29s lost on takeoff. Here, the lives of countless young crewmen ended. If you listen closely, you can hear the past speak here of heroism, human endurance, and tragedy. Every hour of every day since 1945, tortured voices, like oracles from the past, have whispered and cried out their dirges. They emanate from mysterious underground fissures along the shoreline. The spirits of all the tortured souls associated with Tinian seem to return here and prowl restlessly, as if they are still trying to comprehend their part in the great drama which took place here 50 years ago. The past echoes on Tinian from the far reaches of prehistory. Thousands of years ago, other young and brave souls ventured forth from the distant lands across thousands of miles of the western Pacific Ocean to discover and settle what we now know as the northern Mariana Islands. These adventurers became known as the Chamorros. Deep in a hard-to-reach cave in the high cliffs of San Hilo Point, pictographs done by these ancient people tell a mysterious story. Perhaps these images foretell the amazing events destined for the future of the island. They provide one with a unique sense of thousands of years of the human story on the island. The most famous of all prehistoric sites in the Marianas stands on Tinian. The House of Taga site features a solitary stone column 15 feet high. It presides majestically over 11 other columns which have fallen to earth over the years due to earthquakes and the ravages of war. These 12 columns once supported a large structure which was the legendary home of Chief Taga. He was the wisest and most powerful of all Chamorro nobles. The Taga on the island of Marianas is, is the king. Manny de la Cruz, an elder Tinian World War II hero and guide, often explains to returning veterans that on the day when this last column falls, Chief Taga will return to Tinian with unforeseen consequences. 
The reminders of these ancient people stand alongside many of the ruins from World War II, giving the island the presence of a huge cathedral of history. The saga of the Northern Marianas is dominated by foreign subjugation. Foreign interest in the Marianas began as early as 1621 when Spanish explorer Ferdinand Magellan first visited the islands. Spain was first to lay claim to and occupy the islands. Spaniards quickly began the conversion of the native population to the Catholic faith. Today, the timeless voice of Catholicism often echoes from the large churches on Tinian and neighboring Saipan. The large congregations bear witness to the enduring success of this sacred mission. In 1898, the Spanish-American War resulted in the defeat of Spain and its loss of political control of the region. The United States gained control of Guam, while Germany purchased the remaining islands in their quest to build a colonial empire in the Pacific. By 1918, the First World War was over. Germany experienced total defeat, economic ruin, and the loss of her colonial possessions, while Japanese policies of expansionism and imperialism gained momentum. The first major Japanese activity in the Marianas occurred at this time. With these events, the hands on the clock of fate began ticking the countdown to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. To this day, the activities of the Japanese in Asia and the Pacific from the late 1800s to December 7, 1941, have been the topic of intense interest and debate among yeah. scholars. Even before the First World War, in the 1890s, Japan began to embark upon an imperialistic policy which would be its main international policy right up until December 7th, 1941, beyond December 7th, 1941. The war with China in the 1890s was fought largely so that the Japanese could extend their sphere of imperialism to Korea, Taiwan, other islands in the Pacific. Despite U.S. objections, the League of Nations granted Japan a mandate over Micronesia in 1919, and a chain of events was set in motion whose repercussions still affect our world. Even before 1919, the Japanese government had sent personnel to the islands to examine their potential for economic, social, and military development. The South Seas Development Company was established in the early 1920s, and under its astute leadership began the process of transforming Tinian and nearby Saipan into highly productive sugar refining operations. At this time, Tinian's population was very small. As the sugar industry developed, laborers from Okinawa, Korea, and Japan arrived on the island. The native Chamorro presence gradually dwindled and was replaced by foreigners. The Japanese administration constructed villages, railroads, hospitals, the huge sugar mills, and religious sites. They developed the infrastructure to support and direct the island's growing economic enterprise. Tinian Town, today known as San Jose, came to resemble any small town in Japan. It became the center of economic and cultural life on Tinian. The largest of Tinian's six communities, its citizens regarded it as the central hub around which life on the island flowed. From a photo album picked up on Tinian's battlefields by Robert Collins of the 4th Marine Division, we see images of pre-war Tinian as a model of Japanese economic efficiency. The island's rich soil and abundant rainfall enabled the imported laborers and the steadily growing Japanese population to transform Tinian into a major source of sugar for the empire. By 1937, Tinian's huge sugar mills were exporting over 40,000 metric tons of raw sugar to Japan each year. Uh, I only remember now that uh, when we Elder were Islanders out remember the Japanese as stern island, taskmasters who tolerated no deviation from strict codes of work and conduct. Japanese ships full of Tinian sugar sailed to and from the empire in an endless stream. Many came to view Tinian and neighboring Saipan as a part of the Japanese empire itself. The island reflected the Japanese culture in its architecture, religion, and recreation. Many expected life to continue on in this fashion far into the future. By 1943, the civilian population had risen to over 17,000. 
However, in early 1944, the Japanese authorities realized that war would soon come to the Marianas, and approximately 5,000 civilians were evacuated to Japan. The hands on the clock of fate ticked ever closer to the hour of reckoning for the Japanese. At present, the ruins of old Japanese Tinian town still linger like scarred sentinels from the past. Most exhibit evidence of severe damage. The town was practically leveled during the United States pre-invasion bombardment in July of 1944. The administrative offices of the huge sugar mill were some of the only major structures to survive. From here, Japanese administrators directed the highly successful commerce of the island and planned for the future. Tinian's strategic location and its suitability for military airfields had been quickly recognized by the Japanese military. Violating the original League of Nations charter, Japan secretly began the process of developing military installations on Tinian and Saipan. It was during this period that all contact with the outside world was severely restricted by Japan. A veil of secrecy fell over the region. In high levels of the United States government and military, suspicions were increasingly aroused as rumors leaked out about the development of powerful Japanese military installations. Seeking to address Japan's precarious lack of land and raw materials, Japanese warlords initiated a brutal campaign of conquest in China. Japan embarked upon a very militant, very aggressive style of imperialism, which led them to a disastrous blunder, and that was the invasion of China. Absolutely disastrous blunder. Facing the failure in China, the Japanese had to look elsewhere for resources, markets, and wealth, not just to prop up the Japanese economy now, this industrializing economy, but also to prop up the military effort in China. And that's one of the crucial factors in understanding what Pearl Harbor is all about, and understanding the Japanese designs for the Second World War. As blood was flowing in China, Japan maintained on the diplomatic front that no military activities other than normal operations were taking place in her Pacific Empire. Today, evidence on Tinian and nearby Saipan bears witness to the falseness of these claims. Despite the ravages of time and war, the impressive military structures constructed by the Japanese during this era endure. In 1944, their strong ferro-concrete construction withstood weeks of incessant United States pre-invasion shelling. Like the Taga Stones, these ruins will last far into the new century as monuments to the commitment of the Japanese to their program of military development. On strategic islands all over the Pacific, vigorous military development took place. Combat against fortifications on islands such as Tarawa, Roy Namur, Peleliu, Saipan, Okinawa and Iwo Jima would eventually cause thousands of U.S. soldiers to lose their lives. While claiming non-aggressive intentions, the Japanese were constructing massive military structures like the Air Command headquarters which stood on the Japanese Ushi Point airfield on North Tinian. A look inside this large and impressive building gives one a sense of the tremendous damage done by the long United States pre-invasion bombardment of Tinian in July 1944. The strength of its construction also becomes apparent. Despite repeated direct hits by large caliber shells, the building survived. This and other nearby structures obviously required a tremendous commitment of effort and resources. One can wander for hours among these fortifications and ruins and marvel at the construction accomplishments of the Japanese and realize that Japan, despite its claim of peaceful intent, was preparing its Pacific possessions 
for long-term military operations. Surveying this area today, it is hard to believe that this was once the site of a powerful Japanese military installation. Time and jungle have worked to transform this 1944 view to this view in 1995. Viewing the enormous Ushi Point power station bunker in 1944, not a plant or tree could be seen. Today it is covered by thick tropical growth. This huge shell hole from a battleship's main battery fire leaves little to the imagination as to what happened to the Japanese occupants of this structure. Close by, one of two colossal underground fuel and ammunition storage bunkers is still full of burned out 50 gallon gasoline drums. This impressive bunker was devastated by direct hits from US shell fire. The interior was so hot from the fire and explosion of hundreds of barrels of gasoline that the concrete ceiling disintegrated and lies on the floor today like new fallen snow. It must have been a true inferno. Even in its damaged state, it will endure as a testament to Tinian's fiery history. A butterfly finds a moment of peaceful refuge here, where hell once reigned. Japanese bomb shelters in this area provided shelter for the Japanese garrison beneath thick layers of concrete and steel. At present, heavy steel doors still guard the ghostly entrances. The cistern, clearly seen in this photo of 2nd Division Marines capturing the Ushi Point airfield installations, has been swallowed by a forest of Tangan Tangan trees. A visiting relative of some Japanese soldier lost on Tinian has cast a small token of remembrance from an airplane. The tiny parachute with its sacred token has drifted down and now hangs suspended in a tree. Returning Japanese families have left small altars of stones, flowers and other remembrances in obscure spots throughout this area. In 1944, the installations on the island were manned by a garrison totaling approximately 9,000 troops, which included Imperial Japanese Army, Navy, and Korean support personnel. When nearby Saipan was assaulted on June 15, 1944, the Japanese on Tinian realized it would be only a matter of time till they would face the full fury of an American assault. After the U.S. captured Aslito Airfield on southern Saipan, airstrikes and artillery batteries began to rain an incessant hail of artillery shells, bombs and napalm on the Japanese on Tinian. Naval vessels also added the weight of their devastating shell fire to the attack. To survive, military personnel and civilians took to the islands hundreds of caves for shelter from the relentless, thundering barrages. The shells rained down night and day for weeks. Climbing into these dark caverns and viewing pathetic remnants of rusty cooking utensils, medical supplies, ammunition, human bones, and scavenged U.S. equipment gives one an idea of the miserable underground existence Japanese troops and civilians were forced to endure. Even after the island was secured, B-29 crews and Seabees lived in fear of the hundreds of starving and desperate Japanese who hid by day in these caves. snuck out at night to steal food and create havoc in U.S. camps. It was also believed that Japanese holed up in these caves used low-powered field radios to relay information on Tinian B-29 operations to nearby Japanese-held islands such as Rota. This information would then be sent north to Japan, where fighters and flak would be alerted to attack incoming flights of B-29s. It is a chilling thought to think that the corroded radio batteries in this cave may have powered such transmissions 
and been responsible for the destruction of B-29s over the Empire. Many B-29 crews shortly after arriving from the States were astounded to hear Tokyo Rose personally greet their unit on her nightly radio broadcast. Arrival schedules and operational directives for B-29 units were kept top secret, yet somehow, word of their arrival seemed to always reach Japanese intelligence. When we first landed there, we were on this first runway right in here, and when we landed, Tokyo Rose came on that night and says, there's a new outfit here. You're welcome, 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 welcome to us. Welcome us, and said they got a black arrow and you gotta watch for them, and you, I don't know whether you were there or remembered, but she said the 509th, and it's a special outfit, and they got a black circle and black arrow on all the airplanes. We gotta watch them, or something to that effect. Yeah. Oh, and said the wel she welcomed a black arrow squadron to the island. That, that's <laughs> what it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and then we stayed up all night that night. We had them all parked right in here uh, on this first. We were parked right in here yeah. when we first right. got there. Mm -hmm. And then we stayed up all night, took all those circles off, and all of the black arrows. Yeah. So then we took one insignia from all of the other squadrons mm -hmm. and put on all of our 15 airplanes, and then we dispersed them in their squadron. And she come back on the air later. The but I don't know when, but right after things. that, she, <laughs> we have lost that black arrow division. We don't know what happened to them, and we never said a word. After sustaining severe casualties in the bloody conquest of Saipan, the 2nd and 4th Marine Divisions were notified that instead of receiving a well-deserved period of R&R, &R, they would have to spearhead the assault on Tinian in just two weeks. Many young 4th Division Marines were worn out from the weeks of grueling combat on Saipan. Emotionally drained from seeing many of their friends killed and maimed, they were filled with dread and apprehension. Their future looked grim. The terrible carnage on the landing beaches of Saipan was avoided on Tinian by completely surprising the Japanese as to the location of the assault beaches. After much debate and soul searching in the higher echelons of command, it was decided to land U.S. forces on two tiny beaches on the northwest coast of the island. Never before had such a massive force attempted to land on beaches so small. This bold decision echoes in the words of Admiral Spruins, which are emblazoned on the 4th Marine Division monument on the island. Spruins called Tinian the perfect amphibious operation of World War II. Surveying the invasion beaches from the air today, they appear ridiculously small. The Japanese commander on Tinian, Colonel Ogata, thought White Beach 1 and nearby White Beach 2 were so small that there was practically no possibility of a major U.S. amphibious landing occurring there. He felt the U.S. had no choice but to land on the large beach below Tinian Town, eight miles to the south. Here he had prepared many well-sighted guns, which he thought would slaughter U.S. Marine assault units. This short-sightedness proved to be a fundamental error, and it doomed the Japanese forces to a swift defeat. Today the white beaches are serene. Only relics such as old ammunition, shattered pieces of U.S. amphibious tractors destroyed by mines, and two Japanese pillboxes give visitors a clue that a savage conflict once took place here. Manny Dela Cruz often searches for relics of the battle here. His thoughts drift back to a time when the shattered bodies of young Marines lay on this beach in front of this pillbox. On the night of July 25th, the Japanese launched a furious counterattack against the 14th, 23rd, 24th, and 25th regiments of the 4th Division and elements of the 8th and 10th regiments of the 2nd Division. Few realized that combat behind the landing beaches here was as intense and bloody as any in the Pacific War. Concentrated firepower and excellent deployment massacred the attacking Japanese forces. As dawn broke, 1,241 Japanese lay dead. One-seventh of their total force had been killed, and perhaps as many as 700 to 800 more had been wounded and carried away. The Japanese never recovered 
from this crushing defeat. And as a result, the Tinian campaign only lasted another eight days. Many Japanese never surrendered. When the war ended a year later, they were still being discovered lurking in caves and jungle hideouts. A shattered American LVT, buried since 1944, was recently excavated on this battlefield. Fifty years later, it sits as a ghost from the past to remind one of the savage fighting which raged here. The names of its crewmen can still be seen inside the hull. Even as the battle raged, American CB units like the 121st and the 67th landed and immediately set to work on airfield construction. With the arrival of these first CB units, an incredible saga which is today termed a miracle of construction began. Performing one of World War II's most colossal engineering feats, Seabees began developing Tinian into the world's largest airfield complex. Once the Seabees began construction on Tinian's B-29 airfields, the hands on the clock of fate moved ever closer to the hour of reckoning for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yes, here on this small island in the far reaches of the vast Pacific, an outstanding miracle of American construction ingenuity and capability took place. Participating marine engineer units and CB construction units read like a roll call. The 9th, 13th, 18th, 38th, the 50th and the 67th took part in the colossal effort. The 92nd, 107th, 110th, the 121st and the 135th, plus many other CB units also helped turn a devastated island of sugarcane farms and battlefields into World War II's largest and most powerful airbase in an incredibly short time. The speed and magnitude of their accomplishments almost defies rational comprehension. The little known story of the superhuman effort to construct the gigantic Northfield and Westfield complexes is a magnificent tale of American determination, logistical wizardry, and human suffering. Working around the clock shifts, seven days a week for months on end, in blistering tropical heat, the Seabees rewrote the books on airfield construction time. What would have previously taken years was accomplished in months or even weeks. Once the construction work started, it literally never stopped. Earth-moving equipment relentlessly transformed the face of the island. Trucks rumbled to and from the vast coral pits in an endless stream. No one, not even generals, could drive on the haul roads. The work of the haul trucks had the highest priority. The new base facilities and airfields had to be finished as quickly as possible to receive the new B-29 superforts from Boeing. In April of 1995, returning 67 Seabees were amazed to discover that one of the coral pits they first opened during World War II is still in operation. The white crushed coral, which once covered runways, is now used to repair old World War II roadways and to pave new roads on the island. The island base was laid out exactly like New York City. Street names such as 42nd Street, 8th Avenue, and Broadway made the island seem familiar to U.S. personnel. Today, Double Lane Broadway, once full of military traffic day and night, stretches for nine empty miles like a gigantic interstate highway in the middle of a tropical time warp. The 107th CB Monument speaks a silent but awesome message to all who pass this way. To the men of the 107th CB Battalion, and all the Seabees who in 1944 and 45 on Tinian participated in the largest engineering feat of World War II. Seabees created the world's largest air base, enabling the U.S. Armed Forces to end the war in the Pacific. We of the 107th Seabees consecrate this ground to our fallen comrades. May God help us avoid World War III. On Northfield, Along with the four 8,500-foot runways are eight main taxiways totaling nearly 11 miles. It takes hours to carve your way around them today. 
Evidence of the immense earth-moving operations are now hidden by jungle. Cuts as deep as 15 feet and fills as high as 42 feet had to be made in order to construct sections of the runways. Northfield excavations totaled over 2 million cubic yards. The amount of fill required was almost 5 million cubic yards. Here on Westfield, the volume of coral fill required was 3,300,000 cubic yards, and excavations totaled 1,700,000 cubic yards. The total amount of earth and coral moved in just a 10-month period was a staggering 11 million cubic yards. Seabees used an average of 12 tons of dynamite per day. Add to this the construction of 555 hard stands for B-29s and Navy planes, six huge service aprons, 894 airfield buildings and Quonset huts, the 199,000 barrel island fuel storage system, hospitals, harbor facilities, the vast number of personnel campsites and supply facilities, the endless rows of bomb dumps and magazines, and one begins to understand what the term miracle of construction really means. All done in less than a year. Incredible. runways were completed, CBs and other U.S. personnel swarmed to see the first huge B-29s land. They had never seen one of these giants before. They cheered and celebrated, and now they understood what all the backbreaking work had been for. To see how little is left today of this magnificent construction effort also defies comprehension. Almost 50 years later, it's as if one has gotten lost and landed on a different island. Standing on this spot in 1945, one would have had a stunning and spectacular view of the largest airfield complex of World War II in operation. Northfield hummed with incessant activity as hundreds of B-29s and their support personnel and crews went about the deadly task of destroying the empire of the rising sun. Today one looks out onto a forest of verdant tropical growth. Sleeping here are four 8,500 foot runways, hundreds of hard stands, miles and miles of taxiways and thousands of individual stories from members of the 313th Bomb Wing and the 509th Composite Group who once served here. The hundreds of huge silver B-29s are a distant memory. The thousands of servicemen are ghosts on the wind. Further south on Westfield, the sky sends endless patterns of tropical light and shadow, sweeping down the vast runways in a daily ritual, which pays homage to the crews and personnel of the 58th Bomb Wing and Navy patrol units, which once operated from here in 1945. As one flies over this amazing engineering feat today, you realize that one of the most important sites of this century lies unknown to most Americans. Undisturbed since 1945, it's as if the gods of history have decided that it must never be disturbed due to its mythic past. In a sense, it is an emerging mythological site. Native folklore speaks of this mythic saga in terms of young warriors coming from far across the seas. Huge, metallic, silver birds, powerful new weapons, and the ultimate destructive force then known to man. All these dwelt here 50 years ago. Then, as happens in many mythologies, one day the magnificent site was abandoned and the young warriors disappeared across the seas, never to return. Another part of their epic tale lies in the fact that it was on Tinian's North Field that man came face to face with the weapons which would become the ultimate threat to human existence. Here the dark specter of the nuclear nightmare became a reality. The world's first and only combat use of atomic bombs originated from this field in August 1945. When Hiroshima disappeared on the morning of August 6th, mankind crossed a threshold 
which would fundamentally change its existence from that period on. As the immense island construction project progressed, the 67th Seabees were issued curious top secret orders to construct a group of special complexes on the isolated northwest coast of the island. Specifications for these structures seem very puzzling. One of the areas featured three air-conditioned structures, different from any of the others on Tinian. A puzzling requirement called for them to be able to hold a given temperature to within plus or minus three degrees. Air-conditioned buildings in the hot and humid Pacific Islands were practically unheard of in 1945. The 67th was also directed to construct two concrete pits with hydraulic jacks in the bottom, able to lift huge amounts of weight. Due to the strict codes of secrecy, the men of the 67th completed their assignment unaware of what they had constructed and the part they had played in one of history's most important events. Surviving members of the 67th, now well aware of their contribution, returned in 1995 to examine the historic loading pits they had built in 1945. They were all pleased to see that the unit's signature, 67th NCB, drawn into the soft concrete on the day it was poured, was still clearly visible on both pits. Soon, B-29 units began to arrive in sizable numbers. Each B-29 had to be flown from the mainland by way of Hawaii and Kwajalein, out to Tinian. Out they came, at first in trickles, later in growing numbers as production gained momentum. The Indian Maid, with Major Tex Dendi and his crew, was among the first of the 505th Bomb Group's planes to land on North Field. In 1944-45, the hopes of our nation rested on these flying marvels of technology. If they could not bring Japan to her knees, the U.S. would have to invade Japan. National suicide by the Japanese may have been the result. A fight to the finish such as the world had never witnessed was forecast. As a result of the increasingly fanatical resistance by the Japanese on Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Peleliu, and Saipan, as well as the terrifying kamikaze phenomenon, many U.S. experts were predicting millions of casualties on both sides before Japan would surrender. Certainly the, the indications were in the spring and early summer of 1945 that the casualties would be markedly more uh, than D-Day, uh, markedly more uh, than some of the invasions of the uh, smaller islands, the stepping stones to Japan. Uh, some were even indicating that it would be like having uh, Iwo Jima every other day, essentially, in terms of casualties. You'd be fighting an Iwo, Iwo Jima every two days on the shores of uh, Japan. It was the task of the B-29s and their crews to see that this slaughter did not take place. The B-29 was a revolutionary aircraft which incorporated extreme design challenges. Never before had a four-engine aircraft been asked to fly 16 to 18-hour missions carrying such tremendous loads of bombs and gasoline. The plane had been designed fast and put into production much faster than any of the other airplanes had ever been. And they used a lot of magnesium in it because it's the lightest, strongest thing they could get. So when they build up heat, if it ever built to the point they couldn't get the fire out, to ignite the magnesium in the engines, in the wing structure, magnesium burned like a cotton torch. There was no putting it out. And that was it. The wing was gone, of course, when this happened. Very often there were engines out. Uh, and they were lucky to make it back. I remember on my first eight out of 10 flights on B-29s, we lost one or more engines. Due to the war's urgent demand, the B-29 was rushed from the drawing board into mass production. As a result, many design problems plagued the bomber during the early phase of the campaign. Crews experienced many problems with their planes, 
especially the R3350 engines. But the early Wright engines uh, had trouble with overheating and swallowing valves after a long protracted high power climb, for example. With those old carburetor engines, the uh, cylinder head temperatures would go sky high. All the instruments are redlined at the maximum you're allowed, and they go right by the, the old needle go right by the red line. You just sit there and sweat it out. I had a mechanic on my ground crew, and he said he had been at, I believe, Wichita, Kansas, on one of the first B-29 outfits. And he said the plane he worked on, they uh, put 40 different engines on that plane in one month. I was more scared of the damn airplane than the bobs, because they were... They were pretty, those early, early 29s were pretty uh, mean airplanes. It is hard for one to imagine the sheer number of aircraft involved in the Marianas operations. By war's end, almost a thousand B-29s from the 58th, 73rd, 313th, 314th, and 315th bomb wings were operating from Tinian, Saipan, and Guam. From Tinian, the 6th, 9th, 40th, 444th, 462nd, 468th, 504th, and 505th bomb groups carried the war to Japan. In the summer of 1945, the 509th Composite Group would arrive to drop the atom bombs. When they put me on guard duty one night, I remember getting up there one afternoon, I guess around 6 o'clock, those B-29s were starting up and taxing out from all these hard stands, just as far as I could see, B-29s starting up the smoke and the burning of the oil out of the engine, you know, taxing out. Then they started this takeoff right then, four at a time, right down the runway. And you, you know, when I see this guy, and time I'd follow him down the end of the runway, this guy's rolling here. I mean, they were right on the tail. And go, and that went on, and you know, I sit there four hours, and they were still going. I said, boy, oh boy. And this is when they had that about 500, 800 plane raid, one of those big ones. And you know, when I left four o'clock and took my break and come back four hours later, those planes were still taxing out and taking off. And the next morning when I went down there to work, they were coming in. That was the largest air operation, and especially all B-29s. I just couldn't believe that I'm seeing this and part of it. In these World War II films, B-29s taxi and prepare for takeoff from their hard stands on Tinian, Saipan, and Guam. Taking off was often a nightmare for young crews. Overloaded with 14 to 20,000 pounds of incendiary and high explosive bombs and 7,000 gallons of high octane gas. The B-29s were literally gigantic fire bombs. Down the vast runways they went, four at a time on Tinian. One every 60 seconds, past the point of no return. Either you get into the air or you're dead. An engine failure or blown tire meant a horrifying, fiery exit from this world. By the tens, by the hundreds, minute by minute, hour by hour, they lumber into the air until often near the war's end, almost a thousand of these giants were airborne. It became a surreal, awesome, and unforgettable spectacle, one which will remain forever locked into the minds of those who witnessed it. From our tent, we could look out over North Field, and the activity was so intense. There were so many planes taking off. Uh, it was th the busiest airfield I'd ever seen. Then hours and hours later, and I think sometimes up to 16 or 18 hours later, planes would be returning from their missions over Japan. And oftentimes you would, you would see them essentially developing stair-step wise in the distance, coming in for those four parallel runways.
A simulated run down Northfield's vast runway number one today gives one an opportunity to retrace the historic takeoff run of Enola Gay and to experience some of the awesome sensations of thrill and anxiety B-29 crews felt as they hurtled into the sky. In addition to the awesome spectacle of takeoffs, there was a heart-rending and sad part of the B-29 story on Tinny Ann. We just uh, started to roll down the runway and we saw a big ball of fire down to end the runway. And we turned around on the runway and taxied back to the starting place. And we could see two fires burning down there. And we went up to the next runway on our left, which is Baker Runway. and. Uh, we lined up for takeoff, and there was only one airplane ahead of us. And uh, I'd say this, but the same thing happened. And we made a good takeoff, and we flew over the air first airplane that crashed. It was still burning, and we could look out to our left and see the other two that were burning. The one that had crashed last, the fires was really burning because there was a lot of gas left in it. This wasn't one crash, this was three airplanes that crashed. It was probably the most terrible takeoff night that, uh, and uh, all the time, uh, all the B-29s took off at Tinian. Whenever one of those planes went down the runway with 10,000 bombs of high explosives, 6,000 gallons of gasoline, and struggling to get off over the end of the end runway, which ended in ocean, uh, we'd all witnessed the results of, of a crash and the damage it done either with the bombs, and we hauled a lot of mines, and uh, when those explode, you'd lost your comrades, and a lot of other things went with it. Ed Griffin's photos reveal a tragic incident on North Field. Apparently, in the process of taking off, it just didn't make it. And in other words, they sort of stalled into the ground, or the runway, and when they did, they ignited. And of course, the mines, one ignited the other through that explosion. And in the picture, uh, that engine was a long ways from where the crash really was. Uh, and one of the planes were parked in hard sands along the edges, and you could see the damage it done to several of the planes. The fragments from that explosion just done all kinds of damage. And of course, even people on the ground lost their lives in that, or were, were seriously injured. Large numbers of superforts were lost on raids to the Empire. Others went down hundreds of miles from any help, and many simply disappeared into the vastness of the Pacific without a trace. Today, lying deep in jungle growth, are grim reminders of the price paid by the Tinian air crews to defeat Japan. On a recent research expedition, large quantities of B-29 wreckage were discovered in Tinian's jungle growth. Bullet riddled, scorched, melted fragments of B-29s lie rusting on the jungle floor. This is interesting. I, uh, in this pile of B-29 wreckage here, just discovered this melted aluminum, uh, which was once part of a B-29 that crashed, and of course the thing just melted because of the intense heat, and it's, uh, it's shaped like a hand. It's like a sculpture, someone made of a burnt, mutilated hand with fingers on it. Pretty amazing. And over here behind it are 50 caliber machine gun barrels sticking out of a giant glob of melted B-29. And here you can see some more barrels that are just uh, were once in a turret 
but the turret melted in. Now, it's just one big mass of aluminum that these things are sticking out of. These relics are small, sad monuments to all the fathers, sons, friends, and lovers who never returned. The planned air offensive against Japan initially saw the B-29s used in a high-altitude precision bombardment role, which was directed against the Japanese aircraft industry. However, these plans had not taken into account the atrocious weather conditions high over Japan. Heavy cloud cover and high altitude winds, sometimes with a velocity of 200 knots or more, made accurate bombing all but impossible. If a B-29 happened to be going downwind over the target, they could reach ground speeds in excess of 500 miles per hour. True airspeed at that altitude would have converted to about 275 miles an hour. You couple that with the winds that have been known to exist in excess of 200, 250 miles an hour in a core, then you get a speed for which uh, the, 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 the bomber here couldn't crank the bomb sight <laughs> fast enough to uh, in the seas his crosshair. So uh, other than just pushing the pickle button and letting them all go at one time and hope that they hit somewhere, it would be impossible to, to bomb at that airspeed with the technology we had. Japanese fighter opposition was initially very strong, and flak also took a heavy toll. Aviation is hours and hours of boredom, followed by moments of sheer panic, because the fighters, uh, they, they were ferocious. And oftentimes you'd see tracers, and you'd think, oh, that's the, uh, it'd be a string of pearls that would move across the sky in front of you. And you say, oh, some poor guy's really getting hit up there. But suddenly that string of pearls would turn and come in towards you. And there was a, there was a herd that was being flown, and the rudder pedals started dancing, and you knew you were taking hits. The Japanese used a lot of uh, explosive 20 millimeter cannons in their fighters. And uh, they would, in, would penetrate the airframe and then go off. And they start going off the insulation and uh, everything has fallen down in the airplane and the acrid smoke again you know you'd see their wings twinkle that's, was, that's when they were firing their forward firing wing guns when the uh, rounds were hitting us we, we, we could we could feel them we could see the damage they were doing and, uh, but here again they were so scared at surviving that you you weren't scared one occasion, uh, uh, an aircraft uh, hit the tail and took off the old empennage of the whole airplane, and the airplane tumbled end over end over end over end, and nobody got out. The Japanese put up an awful lot of weird stuff that was not anti-aircraft and wasn't propelled by another airplane, but, uh, for example, a whole curtain of fire would suddenly come down across in front of you and you'd fly through it, uh, it would be no impact, no sound, and when you return to base, your airplane would be covered with black soot. But in any case, when you put up anywhere from 200, then sometimes as many as 500, we had as many as, uh, towards the end, uh, a 1,000 D-29s in the air at one time. Certainly, it was easy to believe that some of that uh, coalescent flames and pieces you saw falling out of the sky were two B-29s. I think we lost more airplanes than people could even imagine from, from collisions. Uh, As we turned, here was four engine fires came right by us within about 150 or 200 feet. Well, that other, another airplane almost hit us, and we do not know how many planes were lost based on airplanes hitting each other. It could have been quite a few. When the engine was shot off, it went into a left steep turn and started coming in toward us, and I yelled to the pilot, pull up, pull up. And the co-pilot looked back, and he uh, pulled back on the yoke, 
and the wingtip didn't miss us by more than three or four feet. I could have reached out with my hand and touched it. When, and the thing is, when they went underneath us, that's when we released our bombs, and some of the bombs hit that airplane. He pulled up his aircraft to stall it back into the formation. As Tinian veterans return from reunions with home videos, many spend evenings reviewing footage which gives one a chilling sense of the extremely brutal nature of air warfare over Japan. It was literally kill or be killed. And the Jap Betty bomber came along and flew right into the aircraft, tearing a wing off of it. And the aircraft went into a spiral turn and started to fall. And as it fell, as the boys parrot out in parachutes, the Jap fighters converged and were shooting the kids in the parachute as they went down. And the following mission we went on, a Japanese Betty bomber come down across the top of our flight flying over us to the front and as he pulled up his aircraft to stall it back into the formation the airplane from the aircraft that all the uh, aircraft were shooting at him disintegrated in the air the pilot bailed out in his black parachute and black flying clothes and as he went back passed back over the formation our tail gunner I called the tail gunner and told him he bailed out and immediately after that I heard the 50s on the tail gun firing away and all of a sudden our tail gunner called me up and said Brownie the sun was shining through that son of a bitch before he hit the ground. As losses mounted morale suffered and crews began to wonder if they would survive their tours. At one time the life expectancy for B-29 crews was about 16 missions. You talk about combat hardened people after so many missions and, uh, and a few terrifying things happen to you, you become more apprehensive as time goes by. You're losing airplane after airplane after airplane and you say, holy crime, the odds are going up all the time. Many young crews were forced to try and nurse a shot up and crippled B-29 from the Empire back to base, only to watch their plane slowly lose altitude as it headed for a watery grave. They had to confront the dreaded realization that soon they would have to face the harrowing prospect of ditching in the vast stretches of the stormy Pacific. I asked him if uh, the 680th had lost any crews. And he said, yes, they lost two. Well, that was Red's pilot, uh, airplane commander. And uh, I felt pretty sick, because Red and I were pretty close friends. As the air campaign dragged on, it became apparent that high-altitude strategic bombing was not producing the results expected. Despite heroic efforts by crews, the plan to knock out the Japanese aircraft industry had failed. As of March 5, 1945, not one of the designated nine high-priority targets had been destroyed. The devilish Musashino aircraft factory near Tokyo had been attacked on eight separate missions, but had escaped significant damage. Going in at that altitude, there was one target we kept missing. The word came down from LeMay that you're going to get that target if I have to lower the altitude so you taxi down the street with your Bombay doors open. <laughs> it became imperative that something be done to revitalize the B-29 offensive. A bold new vision was needed to fulfill the mission of destroying Japanese industry and war-making potential. This occurred in a change of leadership, which saw General Curtis LeMay brought from the 20th Bomber Command in the China Burma Theater to take control of the 21st Air Force operations in the Marianas. After several conventional missions, LeMay proposed a revolutionary new doctrine for B-29 operations. Do away with high altitude formations. Strip all the guns from the bombers except the tail guns to save weight. Send them over select targets at low altitude at night with loads of incendiary bombs and attempt to burn the major centers of Japanese war production to the ground one by one. The air crews were astounded when informed of these plans. Many predicted that the low flying and now defenseless attacking B-29 formations would be annihilated by Japanese night fighters and flak. Many crews felt as if they had been given a virtual death sentence, yet they followed orders. 
with a grim determination. Well, therefore, it was a great surprise when we went to our first briefing that involved low altitude, when the briefing officer said, your, your bombing altitude tonight will be 7,000 feet. And uh, people, pilots jumped up in mass and said, sir, you mean 27,000. He said, no, 7,000. Well, they said, well, what the hell did we build a high altitude bomber to bomb at 7,000 feet? There was a great deal of, uh, of, of unhappiness with that first announcement. They said, this is nonsense. And they walked to the back of the room, there were several, took their wings off and put it in the, the, the cigar box. You know, they had done their, their tour and they couldn't fathom the idea of doing that. It was such a worry that some of them almost on the verge of panic and, and some of them to the point of human nature, they'd find any boy or any way they could avoid getting on a mission even. Actually, in retrospect, uh, it was the thing to do because we just weren't getting the, the efficiency, the bang for the buck. The ninth group and its three squadrons uh, the morale was always high, and that's the marvelous thing about youth. I think that we thought well, we were indestructible, and that uh, we never really down deep thought we wouldn't come home. We might fear that we wouldn't. No one ever refused to go to a briefing or get on a truck. The first mission was shrouded in great secrecy. If this gamble did not pay off, the whole strategic campaign could be crippled. Great anxiety gripped the whole command. The target was to be Tokyo, where huge concentrations of fighters and flak existed. On the night of March 9th, the B-29s would fly up singly, no formations. They would attack at low altitude to save gas and increase bomb load. Expert lead crews called Pathfinders marked initial target areas with M47 incendiaries. The following waves would unleash their loads on fires started by these crews. Raging fires immediately broke out and began spreading with astonishing speed. High winds fanned the flames. Soon a fiery catastrophe was upon the city. Panic broke out. The situation was totally out of control in less than one half hour. Before it was over, approximately 100,000 people burned to death and another 40,000 were injured. Radio Tokyo later termed the strike as slaughter bombing. It would be 25 days before the last bodies were removed. This raid produced casualty figures which exceeded those of Nagasaki. I remember this comment that our radar operator made. He'd come up and looked out the window and we was looking down and you you just, square miles of the city was burning and he said, if there ever is a hell, that's it. It was brutal if you think of war, and war is brutal, because we, in a, in a couple of, of maximum effort raids, we practically burned Tokyo to the ground. These structures were all wood, paper, so forth, not built with this fire. They weren't built to protect themselves, and we just set the whole thing in fire. These fire bombs were napalm, that's the jelly gasoline. So we put explosives in these. So when these were ignited, here's a bunch of flaming pancakes that glued right on anything they hit. And then among these, you pepper this with magnesium bombs. And as I mentioned, magnesium burns like cut torch. Clusters would explode and then ignite. And they'd just burn away right through lays, cars, anything they hit. As you got over the flamed area that the, the turbulence was very, very severe. And uh, you have to appreciate that flying at 7,000 feet and seeing flames at that altitude. And I never experienced the violence that I did in those uh, firestorms. Uh, I don't think that we had vision that it was going to be like this at all. I mean, we hadn't been told what it was going to be like, and it was something we had to experience. And if you got into a real firestorm, as we did in Kawasaki and Tokyo and Nagoya, uh, you could smell. It, it was an odor I shall never forget. Everything that would burn in Tokyo was burning, so the odor was uh, almost indescribable. It was certainly not pleasant. It was acrid. Uh, and 
it was a stench and certainly it could have been burning flesh. The initial results of this new bombing doctrine were an apocalyptic revelation. The Japanese population was about to pay a horrible price for the ambitions of their warlords. Operations in the Marianas were mounting in ferocity. In March, a series of fire bombing raids were mounted which became known as the Great Fire Blitz. Fleets of B-29s firebombed major Japanese cities in a blitz which shocked the world. Tokyo on March 10th, Nagoya on March 11th, Osaka on March 13th, Kobe on March 16th, and Nagoya again on the 19th. Almost 50 square miles of the hearts of Japan's largest cities were burned to the ground. The devastation was almost unimaginable. Japanese authorities were stunned. The reality of war had descended on the Japanese like the thunder and fire from hell itself. Even as the 20th Air Force offensive was mounting in intensity during the spring and summer of 1945, a top secret, highly specialized B-29 group was completing training at a remote air base near Wendover, Utah far from the Pacific battlefields. One day soon, this elite group would come to Tinian and change world history. The 393rd Squadron, originally a part of the 504th Bomb Group, which was already on Tinian flying combat missions, had been chosen by the unit's leader, Colonel Paul Tibbets, for perhaps the most important military missions ever undertaken. The unit became known as the 509th Composite Group. As its crews and support personnel arrived at Wendover in the fall of 1944, they were introduced to a regiment of unbelievable secrecy. They were informed that the work they would be doing would significantly shorten the war, but were not there to ask questions. Do your job and keep your mouth shut was the order of the day. Colonel Tibbetts told us that we were going to shorten the war by at least six months. It was going to be a top secret outfit, and the only thing we were to tell anybody was that we were taking B-29 training out of Wendover. We got to um, Wendover, and uh, we hung around for about two weeks while we were being investigated by the FBI. And finally, we were called up to the office, and we, I went into the office first, and this uh, FBI uh, gentleman was sitting there, told me to sit down, and I sat down. He was going over some papers on his desk. He says, well, it looks like you've uh, passed successfully your, your security test. And then he started asking a whole bunch of questions. Um, he asked me if I thought I could keep, uh, he told me that the program was uh, very, very important and if we should give away the secret, we could be executed. He said, it's top security. Then he asked me, he said, can you, can you keep a secret? I said, well, I think I can. And he kind of angrily stood up and pounded on the disc, can you or can you not keep a secret? I said, yes, I can. He said, okay, you go out in the hall and you wait for your buddy. A little while later, Steve Gregg come out and he says, Joe, what the hell are we getting into? I says, geez, I don't know, Steve, but they're going to shoot me tomorrow morning. I hope they tell me today what it is. <laughs> they kept close track of us and they would give lectures periodically and uh, say, remember, you're a lot at stake here. We knew that they were FBI agents, but uh, we weren't privileged to tell anybody that, of course. These two fellows had been in, in Salt Lake City, and they had passed some kind of remark. I can't remember what it was, but they were going to end the war, something like that, and in, in just a short period of time, or whatever it was. And uh, they, they had been pumped by some uh, FBI guy, and they made this little slip. And uh, they got up there and everyone thought, well, gee, these guys are going to get shot. <laughs> and uh, they said they were going to send them up to the Aleutian Isles where they could shout their head off and nobody would ever hear them. And they put them on an airplane and flew them out. We got on the troop train, got to Wendover. When we got to Wendover, we got off at the train station and we were met at the station by Colonel Tibbetts and, and the deputy CEO, uh, Colonel Klassen his intelligence officer and some of the other members of his staff. They took us immediately into the base, took us to a room. Now, uh, Tibbetts decided to tell us at this time 
that we had a bomb that could destroy an entire city and of course that uh, picked up my attention right away. As soon as we walked in the door of being aircraft armament people, we knew that they were bombs. And we know that saw two types of them sitting there. There were several of them in the building. And we were assigned to work with a Sergeant Joe Seerace, a little short Italian fellow from uh, Texas. Joe took us over and he put his hand up on the bomb and he patted it and says, this here is an atom bomb. If this bomb was to explode, there'd be a great big hole in the ground where Utah used to be. Well, you know, when you're that kind of thing, you could just feel your your hair in the back of your neck kind of standing up, and it was kind of scary. 509th crews began long training flights over the western deserts. Curious flight and bombing procedures were introduced. Bombing accuracy was stressed. They were told that they had to be able to hit the target from 30,000 feet consistently. Excellence in all operational phases was demanded. Uh, our proficiency was always looked at very, very, very carefully. And the point of camera bombing, we would open the, open the bomb bays and we would uh, actually have the cameras hooked up to the bomb site in such a way that when the indices would cross and the bomb the, was to be released, the uh, cameras would start working and we would be able to photograph uh, what we were supposed to be hitting uh, with the bomb. We had this casing that the bomb was in, and but when they drop them, they tumble. And we had to experiment with different type of tail fins, and that's what we were doing. And once they got that done, then they had to uh, uh, drop a lot of them to, to make bombing tables. Bombardiers use bombing tables. You uh, consider the wind direction and the humidity and the temperature and everything and set it in your bomb site. They painted the yellowish color bomb and they painted the black stripe on it so they could watch it when they take pictures and they could tell whether or not their trajectory was going through. Uh, one of the instances, the, um, the baffles and the tail of the bomb is only a small section where the air can go through. Well, the uh, spaces where the air went through were not large enough, and what that did, it would start dumping air from side to side, and the bomb would just wobble all the way down. The last test that they did at Wendover, they uh, were, got the uh, fuses to explode just the right height off the ground. We saw the plane come over way up high, about 30,000 feet, I guess, and uh, the bomb dropped, and. Uh, it got down to a certain altitude, it was still pretty high in the air, just a big puff of white smoke, and that was it. And they said the, the uh, fusing had been perfected. It was our turn to be on the ground and watching the thing fall and exploding. Well, anyway, at the, after the explosion, well, there was a big hole in the barn, in the ground, like a, a hip roof barn, you know, about that size. And they had these guys there, the civilian scientists. I went up and asked one, I said, well, my God, what are we fooling around with this for? I mean, all we're making is a big hole in the ground. That wasn't doing anything, you know. <laughs> and uh, he says, well, you see those buildings over there? They're three miles away. And he says, well, this will take the windows out of those buildings, out of every one of them. So that's when I kind of got an inkling there was something going on. Many crews wondered what this was all about. What kind of weapon required this sort of preparation to drop? The war was being waged thousands of miles away in the Pacific. They puzzled over what all this strange training had to do with fighting the Japanese. The largest bomb any of them could comprehend was the 22,000 pound British Grand Slam. They wondered if this could be what they would be dropping. Wendover was terribly isolated and forced crews to look to each other for companionship. Bonds of friendship were forged which have endured for 50 years. For me, it was exciting because I had never been that far west. And uh, as we drove out to Salt Lake City, I thought, oh, what a beautiful city. And I thought, oh, we're going to be stationed in a lovely place. And it, about an hour later, we ended up in Wendover. And what a change. <laughs> the Salt Lake, Salt Flats of Wendover. It was uh, desolate hills around it. Um, it looked like barracks. Uh, one little shopping center uh, and State Line Hotel, and that was it. <laughs> we knew that we had to depend on each other. There was an extreme uh, closeness.
to everyone. We uh, got along very, very well. We uh, had a, a very, very strong regard for the abilities of each person, especially the crews. There's a brotherhood there that will never, never go away. I'm going to be 72 years old. And I'm amazed that I can, when I see some of these guys, I know their first names. But they're like brothers to me, and that's, that's the way I feel. And I think everyone in the squadron uh, feels, feels the same way, at least in the crews. Meanwhile, in a remote location at a former boys' school at Los Alamos, New Mexico, another momentous top-secret project was underway. Under General Leslie Groves, a brain trust of Europe's and America's most brilliant scientific minds had been hard at work for months. They were performing prodigious feats of intellectual work on the problems associated with the development of the world's first atomic bombs. They were in a race against time. When the work first began, it was predicted by many experts that the job would prove to be impossible. Many experts maintained that it couldn't be done in the short period of time available but great progress was being made. On February 19th, the heavily fortified island of Iwo Jima had been assaulted by units of the 3rd, 4th, and 5th Marine Divisions. This bloody battle proved to be the costliest in Marine Corps history and gave the world a lesson in carnage seldom seen before or since. The battle provided a glimpse of the fanatical resistance expected when the planned invasion of Japan itself took place in November. Iwo Jima survivors recently made a pilgrimage to this island on the 50th anniversary of the battle. The experience was profound. I got hit twice, shrapnel in my left arm and a bullet hole in my right arm. It's hard to believe that I'm here now. I can't, I can't believe it. Although time and nature have erased much evidence of the struggle, Mount Suribachi still stands a silent vigil over the beaches eternally sanctified by the loss of so many young lives. By March 14, 1945, the island had been declared secured, even though fighting would rage on for weeks. Seabees and marine units were already hard at work on a B-29 landing strip. The island had been taken specifically for battle-damaged B-29s so that they would have a safe haven on the way back from the Empire. On March 4th, Tinian-based Dynamite became one of the first B-29s to make an emergency landing even as fighting still raged on the island. This was the first of many harrowing crash landings on Iwo. Eventually, more than 2,250 B-29s and over 25,000 crewmen would be saved by the gallant sacrifice of the Marines. Reuben Best wears a special shirt which shows a startling painting of his superfort halfway home, mangled and burning after one of the war's most spectacular crash landings on Iwo Jima. The plane had two engines shot out and suffered other severe damage. After making two desperate and unsuccessful attempts to land, halfway home made one last-ditch attempt. On our, our third and final approach, just before we touched down, or was in a position to touch down, they drove a DA Caterpillar tractor on the, on the end of the runway. And the intent was, uh, I'm sure, to slow us down or try to get us to hit it and, and stay on the runway as opposed to drifting airborne off to the side, which we could do more damage and wiping out. You know, a lot of people were, were being endangered by our situation. So we did hit the, uh, the bulldozer with the nose gear. Pilot pulled the oak back quickly and, and uh, caught the nose gear. The D8 cat went between the fuselage and number three engine. And then we ripped open the fuel tanks and then we were torched going down the runway. And we hit, uh, we still, 
uh, went off to the left as soon as he put power to it. That made us pull left again. And so we went into seven P-51s before we came to a grinding halt. And they were loaded for an escort mission, and they had ammunition on board and full fuel. The pilot told me later that uh, he was convinced, and looking back at the airplane, he said he didn't think any of us survived in the back because of the way the airplane was burning. makes you thank some people. First of all, somebody upstairs who was looking over you. And secondly, I think, uh, you know, the Marines that gave a lot of their lives to, uh, to take the island. The month of March 1945 also saw the arrival on Tinian of the 58th Bombardment Wing recently transferred from their bases in China. They moved into the just completed Westfield complex, four miles south of North Field. Their battle-tested squadrons added vast new strength to the thundering air assault from Tinian. March also saw the beginning of the mining campaign by B-29s. Mines sown by Tinian's bomb groups would cause tremendous destruction to Japan's already weakened merchant marine. They sank more boats by the mines we dropped than all the boats, the rest of the boats was ever sunk by ever anything else. That's how bad it was. It was called Operation Starvation. Along with the bombings, uh, we, we mined the harbors. And we mined these with a combination of uh, vibration-triggered uh, uh, mines as well as magnetic. These could be set for up to five disturbances. In other words, you could go over these five times, four times, and the fifth one would get you, but you never knew which one. They, they, we got them coming and going until we really shut the commerce way down. By the end of June 1945, the 509th Composite Group, through vigorous training, had become a highly proficient and very confident group. They began to transfer from the remote Wendover field out to the great Northfield complex on Tinian. The unit's 15 aircraft commanders had handpicked the latest production model of the B-29 for their group. We said these B-29s that we were flying around weren't good enough. So then they, then they, then they made a whole new batch of B-29s uh, at uh, the Martin plant in Omaha, Nebraska. And, and then the, uh, the boxcar, but actually the boxcar was the second of the 15 B-29s to be assembled at the Martin plant in Omaha, Nebraska. We had several modifications that improved the performance. For one thing, we had you know, fuel injection instead of carburation on the engine, so the, the fuel was more evenly distributed to the 18 cylinders of those engines. And we didn't have uh, uh, severe overheating problems. Then the fact that, that all of the armament was stripped out of these airplanes, except for the tail guns, greatly reduced not only the weight of, of all this uh, armament, but um, it also improved the uh, streamlining of the airplane because instead of having these turrets and, and blisters and so forth, we had much smoother uh, surfaces and much less uh, air resistance, so we, you know, we could carry heavier, lo heavier loads, fly faster, higher, so forth. These marvelous new planes, among other things, featured reversible pitch propellers, this feature would later help save the lives of the Nagasaki strike crew. They also featured new wink bomb bay doors, which opened and shut in an instant. Their 15 B-29s represented the cream of the crop. As members of the group headed out to Tinian, they expected to see the usual inadequately equipped frontline base. They were utterly astounded at what had been accomplished by the CBs. Then we flew into Tinian, and it was wonderful. <laughs> it was green, and there were beaches, and uh, the Seabees had done a tremendous job of fixing that place up. Those four 10,000-foot runways, parallel with runways that we had at Northfield, and it, it just seemed like a great place. Colonel Tibbetts had the group moved into a fine new camp, recently vacated by the Black Cats of the 13th Naval Seabees. The new camp featured excellent facilities constructed by the 13th and overlooked the four great Northfield strips. 
By July 1st, 1945, the air-conditioned, top-secret atomic bomb assembly areas built by the 67 Seabees had been completed. The only thing I say, I figured it out after we left here, that it had probably had something to do with the bombs, but I didn't know what it was all about at the time. Viewing the lost ruins of these complexes today, it is difficult to imagine that here the most destructive devices then known to man were assembled. On these concrete floors, members of the 509th's first ordnance unit, along with technicians and scientists from Los Alamos, installed the top secret components of the first atomic bombs, called Fat Man and Little Boy. Bombs called pumpkins were shipped out from Wendover and assembled here. These immense rounded units looked exactly like the Fat Man, but instead of containing the intricate atom bomb mechanisms, their interiors were packed with powerful high explosives. We were given heavy responsibilities. Uh, there was no one looking over our shoulder every minute. We were expected to take these responsibilities and perform accordingly. And I was amazed at how much responsibility we were given considering our tender young ages. The unique Fat Man symbols on the noses of the 509th B-29s represented missions on which one of these pumpkins were dropped. In a little-known episode of World War II, the 509th would eventually fly 49 conventional missions against the Empire using 10,000-pound pumpkin bombs. They hit carefully selected targets with devastating results. After talking aircraft commander Claude Etherly and his crew out of bombing the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo, Felix Thornhill, navigator of Straight Flush, recalls the incredible destruction their bomb caused. We were within uh, 15 miles of the palace when this all came about. And we had to go over it, right past it, to drop it on this station. And I had, boy, I got my, I, I was the oldest guy in the group, older than Italy, and I told Italy, I said, you know, I'm on this damn crew, but Tim has put me on here to try to keep everybody in here out of trouble. You may not know it, but that's what I'm doing here, and you better not drop it. Because if you do, I'm, uh, you, we're going to get court martial. I'm not, but the rest of you are. But you're going to do it against my will. And Elder came back and said, Thornhill is right. We're not going to drop it, period. We're going to drop it. And we dropped it on this railroad station. You should have seen the explosion. It, we dropped it just as the train came in. It hit one of them locomotives, and I bet it went three, 200 feet high. The whole locomotive was spinning in the air. And the whole, we hit it dead center, the bombardier did, and I don't have any hundred people to kill. But I said, no, we didn't try to drop that bomb on the palace. Hell, he could have dropped salvo it and hit it if he wanted to. And they said he missed it. He never tried to hit it. So they were, somebody told the story that we did, but that's not true. I told Tibbets several times, that was a, he said I knew it was a bunch of bull. Back in the U.S., in the early morning of July 16th, at this spot, the New Mexico desert sky exploded into an incredible brilliance such as the world had never seen. A monstrous, fiery mushroom cloud erupted. The desert floor melted, and massive shock waves rocked the area from a blast which equaled almost 20,000 tons of TNT exploding. A milestone in human destiny had been reached. The world's first atomic bomb had been detonated successfully. The scientists and physicists from Los Alamos had done the impossible. A new age had dawned on an empty track of desert, prophetically called the journey of death. Meanwhile, a controversial series of meetings in top levels of the U.S. government and military led to orders being issued for the world's first tactical use of atomic weapons. These actions have led to 50 years of heated and intense controversy. After extensive study, Professor Joseph Manzione maintains that perhaps the basis for this enduring controversy lies with the decision-making process itself. Basically, what Truman did, and to a large extent what Stimson did, what the Navy and Army chiefs did, what Secretary of State Burns did, even what the scientific advisors who were part of that council, those committees, uh, people like J. Robert Oppenheimer and Ernest Lawrence, what they did was to defer the decision to other people who were more closely associated with the making of the bomb. 
And that largely came down to General Leslie Groves, along with some other military personnel. Those military personnel put together the mission profile. They put together the strategic list of strategic targets. They were generally responsible for advising, influentially advising on those military targets. And uh, for all intents and purposes, because the president deferred the decision, because others also deferred this decision, they were the ones who ended up making the decision that it being a war emergency, virtually any action that was necessary to win the war was acceptable in moral or strategic or economic or political terms. Any action, virtually any action, was acceptable, even action that would take the lives of hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children. The second reason why these people seemed to be convinced uh, about the necessity of dropping the bomb even before a decision was made we had spent billions of dollars to build the thing. It seemed utterly irresponsible to these leaders in the context of that time not to use it. Leslie Groves, the general in charge of the Manhattan Project, once remarked that if the bomb had not been dropped on Japan, that he would have had to have bought a house in Washington, D.C., so because he would spend the rest of his career testifying before Congress as to why it wasn't dropped. The idea, again, of spending this money and spending these resources only to come up short, not use the thing in a time of war, was an anathema to these people. As targets were being studied and selected for the initial atomic strikes, crews had begun to wonder why they had been specifically ordered never to bomb a specially designated list of Japanese cities. And I show my notes here, do not bomb Nakata, Kyoto, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Kokora. On July 16th, the ill-fated heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis began a high-speed run from San Francisco out to Tinian, carrying part of the priceless fissionable material for the first bombs in a lead bucket welded to her deck. By July 30th, she would be at the bottom of the sea with over 800 of her crew dead, a victim of one of the greatest disasters at sea in the history of the U.S. Navy. Tinian Harbor was a small harbor, and here sat the cruiser Indianapolis. And that's just like putting a heavy cruiser into Cross Lake or Madawaska Lake. It just didn't fit. So we, uh, it was long in the afternoon when the Indianapolis left. Of course, at that time, we didn't know what its mission was. But shortly afterwards, we found out its mission, and then two days later, it was sunk in the China Sea. The Indianapolis went down. As a curious footnote, the Japanese submarine I-58, which torpedoed the Indianapolis, was based in a port city called Hiroshima. The last segments of fissionable material arrived on July 28th and 29th after being flown out by the 320th in their Green Hornet C-54s. The scientists and first ordnance detachments completed the assembly of Little Boy on July 31st. Tibbets was notified that the first mission would go on August 6th. No one knew how many atomic strikes it would take to make Japan surrender. How destructive the bombs would prove to be when unleashed on a large Japanese city was still a question mark. The vast scientific industrial complex in the U.S. was gearing up to send atomic bombs to Tinian on an assembly line basis. Tibbets had already decided which crews would fly the first atomic strike missions. The final sequence of events leading to the first atomic strike mission in history was set in motion. The hands on the clock of fate were ticking off the final minutes. August 5th on Tinian was for most U.S. servicemen just another day in the endless grind of operations. But unknown to most, it would be the last day of warfare in the old sense of the word. The world was about to change in a most profound way. In the afternoon of August 5th, the little boy was loaded onto its trailer and very carefully transported to number one bomb pit. 
The crews and scientists received their final special briefings. Last minute pre-flight adjustments and equipment checks were run. Guards were posted around the plane with orders to shoot anyone who approached the plane without clearance. Tension mounted throughout the day. Around midnight, a final briefing took place. Tibbets was issued cyanide capsules to pass out to the crew if they were in danger of being shot down and captured. Then the crews went to the special pre-flight meal in the 509th's galley, which stood here. Today, the sink where the pre-flight meals were prepared lies rusting and forgotten. Perhaps strike crew members ate from one of these trays while they exchanged nervous pre-flight small talk. The weather planes took off at 1.37. Claude Etherly's crew flew straight flush to Hiroshima and doomed that city by reporting the weather was clear over the target. We flew right over Hiroshima. It was a beautiful city. And there was just, wasn't any clouds. If somebody had a question about that, there might have been a few later. But nobody bothers paid a bit of attention to us. Around 1.45 a.m., as the crew of Enola Gay arrived on the tarmac before the flight, they found an eager group of cameramen and photographers there to record the initial phase of their mission for posterity. All of us went down and set up lights in the perimeter uh, after the plane had been, after the bomb had been loaded at the pits and it was brought back up to the line. Uh, a large crowd started to gather and we had a, a movie lights set up and uh, uh, our photographers were there. I did a, a photograph of the crew and it went kind of fast. I guess it might seem slow, but it went like in about 15 minutes. Uh, and I think it was about the last shot I took before I, uh, I t turned around and had my camera ready for the next thing. Always get ready. And uh, I turned around and uh, I didn't see the crew. And before you know it, the next thing you know, I saw Colonel Tibbetts in the cockpit. I mean, this all happened within a few seconds, it seemed. And uh, I had the camera ready. I had the this, this slide drawn. And uh, he was right at the window. And the next thing you know, I said, Colonel, would you please wave? And he put his head out the window and gave a big smile to his left and he waved and I, I photographed the, the event. And before you know it, the window closed up and uh, next thing you know, he revved up the engines and he was off and it slowly moved down the runway. The, the noise was getting louder and louder and he kept going slowly and slowly and started picking up speed. He was down the runway, you could see the blue flames coming out, just roaring out the exhaust. And he kept going, and the plane slowly rose and kept going, and it dipped down the end of the runway. You couldn't see it. And then it slowly rose up. I had my fingers crossed. I knew it was going to be all right. I just had that feeling nothing would go wrong. The well-documented mission went precisely according to plan. It would become known as a textbook operation. At about 9.15 in the morning of August 6th, Hiroshima achieved everlasting notoriety as the first city to be obliterated by an atomic bomb. At 2.58 p.m., Enola Gay, after an uneventful return flight, touched down on Tinian. As she taxied back to her hard stand, activity on busy North Field went on as usual. Many personnel still had no idea of the colossal event which had just taken place. Curious crowds of ground personnel began to crowd around the plane and crew as they climbed out of Enola Gay. The gravity of the historic event in which they had just participated had not registered yet. The anxiety over years of controversy which would follow was not evident on their young faces in those moments. Showing the exuberance of youth, they were just happy to have accomplished their mission and be back on North Field. To honor the mission's success, General Carl Spatz awarded Colonel Tibbetts the Distinguished Service Cross in a hastily staged ceremony witnessed by all the top brass that could be assembled. Each member of all the mission's crews were later awarded the Silver Star. Washington now waited for the official Japanese response to the destruction of Hiroshima. A terse statement had been issued warning the Japanese of destruction such as the world had never witnessed if they did not surrender. Leaflets were showered on Japan's cities by the millions, informing the population of what lay in store. 
Would Japan surrender, or would the second bomb have to be used? Suspense mounted. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. By August 8th, without receiving an appropriate Japanese reply to Allied surrender mandates, it was decided that a second atomic mission would be flown. Chuck Sweeney's crew would fly the mission in Captain Fred Box B-29, called Boxcar. The designated target would be Kokura. The alternate would be a seaport called Nagasaki. On the afternoon of August 8th, the Fat Man underwent final preparations for its deadly mission. Then the well-autographed monster was loaded aboard its transport trailer and carefully pulled along this road to the loading pits. It was on a ride into the pages of history. This historic road over which the bombs traveled to the loading pits 50 years ago now lies overgrown and forgotten. Today, the Nagasaki loading pit is a featured attraction for the few tourists and veterans that make the pilgrimage. However, other artifacts like the remnants of one of the atom bomb transport trailers and the reinforced steel I-beam from which the atom bombs were suspended during final assembly lie rusting and forgotten in the overgrown tech areas. Fred O'Levy was just 22 years old when he went on the adventure of a lifetime. Fred was normally co-pilot of the B-29 Great Artiste, but since that plane was now being flown by Captain Fred Bach as an instrument plane to measure blast, O'Levy found himself third pilot on the strike plane boxcar. Chuck Sweeney was aircraft commander, and Charles Albury was co-pilot. The second atomic strike mission is a story much different from the first one. Men and machines were stressed to the limit, and the mission came perilously close to disaster. In many ways, it is much more intriguing than the often documented Hiroshima mission. We found out that there was a, a malfunctioning booster pump that brought the gasoline from the rear bomb bay up to the wing tanks and then into the uh, engines. Again, uh, the decision was made by, by Sweeney and by uh, Tibbetts, and Tibbetts says, don't worry about that gasoline in the back. We had 600 gallons in the rear bomb bay. He says, don't worry about it because that's going to be your ballast for the 10,000 pound atom bomb in the front. Well, unbeknownst to us, we could have used that gasoline later on in the mission, of course. Just after we broke ground, we just lifted off the ground, I heard a loud explosion. Like, to me, I thought it was a tire exploding, like sometimes it, it occurs. And uh, I looked at, uh, at Alberry, and uh, he looked at me, and I wondered what it was. And I thought, well, right off the bat, we were going to be in trouble. Of course, our, our next step was to rendezvous at Yakushima, just a little bit south of, of the Japanese Empire. Uh, we were supposed to meet with three aircraft there. Uh, and uh, we were the first ones, the, the boxcar was the first one to reach the rendezvous point. And five minutes later, we were uh, joined by Major Bach. He was Captain Bach at the time. We were instructed to wait 15 minutes. We waited 15 minutes, and uh, Major Hopkins never showed up. He was a photographic aircraft. The great artiste was the one that carried the instrumentation for the bomb drop simultaneously at the same time. And uh, we waited the 15 minutes. He didn't show up. Major Sweeney decided to wait another 15 minutes. Still, Hopkins didn't show up. For some reason, Sweeney says, let's wait another 15 minutes. In total time, it was 45 minutes. Keep in mind that we were at 30,000 feet. We were pulling all this power and using all this gasoline. Finally, Sweeney said, let's go on to our primary, which was Kokura, not Nagasaki. Nagasaki was our secondary target. Uh, we flew about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and we got to our, our primary uh, target of Kokura. Now, because of the delay over the, the rendezvous point, the weather conditions had changed. And when we got there, there was about a 7 tenths to 8 tenths cloud coverage. Again, we were instructed to drop this thing visually. Behan couldn't see it the first time. We made two other bomb runs in hopes of seeing the aiming point. We didn't see it. About this time, it was decided that we had to go to our secondary target. 
also at this time we had to figure out our gasoline consumption and we found out that we had enough gasoline for one bomb run over to Nagasaki we got to Nagasaki and it was worse the cloud coverage was between eight tenths and nine tenths cloud coverage we started our, our radar run immediately because our gas situation warranted it starting it immediately and, and getting uh, through with the, with the bomb run. So we were about 95, 96% complete, went up in the nose. Uh, Captain Behan, the bombardier, says, I see it, I see it, I've got it. So the bomb run was relinquished to him and uh, he took over and he had only about 45 seconds, 40, 35 to 45 seconds to set up the Norton bomb site, kill the drift, and dropped the bomb. This he did. He was the one that saved our necks and we dropped the bomb visually like we we're supposed to. If we hadn't have done that, I don't know what would have occurred uh, later on when we got back to base. But anyway, it happened the way we, we were supposed to and the way we were ordered to. Now, the minute we dropped the bomb, uh, the aircraft jumped up and we turned into a left bank, a 60 degree bank, and we wanted to head back in the opposite direction of, of 180 degrees. As we were in the turn, I remember looking out the window and we had special glasses on, and uh, the big flash came that the bomb went off. We were in bright sunlight above all the clouds, and uh, when it went off, it was 100 times brighter than the sun itself. At this time, the mushroom cloud came up. As it came to our altitude, just below the, the cap of the mushroom was a, a, like a boiling cauldron of, of smoke and fire. And I remember the distinctive color of a salmon pink that stuck in my mind. And uh, it got to our altitude and went on past our altitude. Again, we were at 30,000 feet and it got up to 50 or 60,000 by the time it stopped rising. Captain Fred Bach and other crewmen in Great Artiste were also left with profound impressions. Nagasaki area, we saw the uh, boiling mass of clouds, uh, uh, really uh, it looked like a seething cauldron of uh, purplish uh, and various other colors uh, moving uh, upward almost you know, like some growing, something growing, uh, boiling, rising up. Uh, some of the photos that are mo have been most widely published, I think of the Nagasaki bomb, I believe were taken from our airplane. Our tail gunner, Bob Stark, uh, was, was given a, uh, a camera, a motion picture camera, I believe, and he also took uh, still photographs. Well, to be very frank, um, I obviously thought it was something that rather unreal, but I was really captivated by the, the beauty of the whole thing. I mean, it seems a little ridiculous, you're killing a lot of people, but it is true that the mushroom itself, it's too bad that we did not have good colored photography then because it was a beautiful sight to behold. And uh, with the view of the mushroom and how it looked and looking down below it and seeing the fires all over the area uh, across the whole bay was something really rather awesome. I mean, I really, I was amazed that by dropping a bomb, you could cover such a wide, wide area. And I was taking constant up and down pictures of the mushroom and the column as it came and progressed and got up and beyond our height. Within two minutes, it was beyond uh, our altitude, which is 30,000. And I think around three or four minutes, it was at 50,000. So that was really awesome. I, that was, to me, was something I'll never forget. It was a tremendous sight. Uh, who bombed away the same as others and still had that kind of power. I thought I'd been privileged to see something that most people hadn't seen. I wrote a letter home, uh, both my mom and the rest of my wife, and uh, I said, today I had a ringside seat at a moment in history, and of course, William Lawrence is talking in my other ear already about this is the time, new time starts. This is zero hours of a new world. Even though the fat man had missed its target by over two miles, the power of the blast utterly devastated the city. Approximately 40,000 people were immediately killed or simply disappeared. Over 60,000 were doomed by burns, blast injuries, and radiation. The immense Mitsubishi steel and armament plant was utterly devastated. 
Conditions in the ruins of the city were appalling. Fires burned fiercely for over 48 hours. The shock survivors were left to face a nightmare of gigantic proportions. The thunder from Tinian had brought Japan to her knees and shaken the world. In the cave on Tinian, the prophetic vision of the ancient pictographs of figures lying scattered across the ground had come to pass. And we were concentrating on seeing what we can see down below and nobody was paying attention to the mushroom cloud because the mushroom cloud was radioactive and the scientists had told us don't get into it because it could do us harm. So uh, all of a sudden somebody from the back hollered, the mushroom cloud is coming toward us. And of course this created a hazard that we didn't want to get involved with. So when Sweeney saw this, he drove the aircraft down to the right, full throttle, picking up speed so we can get away from being engulfed by the, the cloud. For a while, I couldn't tell whether we were gaining on it or it was gaining on us, but eventually, little by little, we pulled away from it. And if we would have gotten into the, the uh, uh, radiated cloud, I don't think I'd be here to tell the story. So after that happened, of course, our next problem was getting to Okinawa. And uh, again, our problem was the gasoline. I think the flight to Okinawa was about maybe an hour. So we had figured we had enough gasoline to get to Okinawa after we made our bomb run. I guess it really was a very close thing that the boxcar didn't have to, uh, didn't have to ditch. Because when they landed, they, they claimed that there was very little gas in their main tank. We could not raise the tower. We had to declare May Day. We fired all our flares, which indicated Red meant we had wounded on board, and, and there were six or seven other colors, each indicating something wrong on board. But we fired all we had, and I think it was about seven or eight of them. Sweeney broke into the traffic pattern and cut out two or three aircraft that were on the final approach. Now, when we did this, we hit the, the active runway going pretty fast. Because we had reversible props on the aircraft, we actuated the reversible props, and that brought the aircraft back under control stayed on the runway, and as we turned off the active runway, our number two engine quit. We had that much gasoline left. If we'd have to make another circle to get into the field because we couldn't uh, get landing instructions, we would have to ditch into the ocean. As reports of the catastrophic destruction in Hiroshima, combined with the shocking news of Nagasaki, were received, Japanese leaders were faced with the realization that the United States had indeed developed incredibly destructive atomic weapons and would now be able to systematically obliterate the empire. The emperor now realized that surrender loomed as the only sane course of action. August 14th became a red letter day for the 20th Air Force, for it saw the grand finale of the 20th Air Force operations in World War II. Most crews took off expecting to hear news of the surrender on their way up to Japan. An American Finally it came. The word everyone had prayed for and waited so long to hear. Before the last B-29s from the August 14th missions landed, President Truman's voice flashed out over the radio announcing the news that the Japanese would at last surrender. On Tinian, wild and boisterous celebrations commenced. It was almost unbelievable. The war was over. Months of pent-up anxiety, fear, fatigue, and homesickness resulted in a bout of long-lasting and passionate celebrations. I, I think we, you are going to find that uh, uh, there will not be a tremendous wave of guilt washing over the United States of America in August of 1945. And I myself, while I am anything but uh, a Yankee Doodle dandy uh, right-wing flag waver, I uh, am convinced in my own mind that the use of those two atomic bombs saved Japanese lives as well as American lives in the long run. When uh, the surrender was announced, I was loaded up on an APA with uh, uh, Marines and went up to Japan and made the occupation landing with the uh, 4th Marines uh, at Yokosuka Naval Air Station, south of Tokyo. I saw for myself there 
and of course there were many other evidences of it that uh, weren't in front of my eyes. Uh, the caves that were dug into the hills that rose up from the sea there, of the many, many ways in which the Japanese could have fought desperately and probably almost to the last man if they hadn't been ordered to surrender. And I know that the attempt at the invasion of Japan by the United States and Allied forces would have cost thousands and thousands of American Allied lives. The other aspect of that is that I really feel that uh, uh, what I guess I will rather carelessly call a guilt trip has been laid on uh, Americans for years uh, because we dropped the atomic bombs. Without the recognition or the awareness in most cases that the Japanese were trying to build an atomic bomb. Uh, the main reason why they didn't get it done was they started a bit late and uh, American planes bombed out the laboratory in which they were trying to do the uh, first work toward the uh, uh, kind of uh, bomb that uh, they might have been able to build. But there is no doubt in my mind that if they had beat us with an atomic bomb, we might very well have been the recipients instead of the deliverers of an atomic bomb. And one of the last things that happened uh, at the, toward the end of the war was that a Gem German submarine was traveling from Germany to Japan with fissionable materials aboard, which were to be used for the Japanese bomb project. It was captured. Nobody ever has found out what happened to the materials aboard it. As fall gave way to winter in 1945, the furious pace of wartime activities at the world's largest air base slowly ground to a halt. Aircraft and ground personnel were sent stateside. Camps and facilities were abandoned. Equipment worth millions of dollars was discarded or left behind on the island. First years, then decades began to slip by. Now 50 years has passed. Time and nature continue their relentless efforts to erase all vestiges of the historic past. Now, in the twilight of their lives, the years have given Tinian veterans who were involved in those momentous proceedings a unique perspective of history and prospects for the future. I'm not a murderer. I says we were at war. If the Japanese would have had the, the same weapon, they would have used it on us. We were lucky enough to get the, the uh, secret of, of the atomic bomb, and we used it to end the war. It was a conclusion, a uh, concluding episode in the, in the biggest war there ever has been, and it demonstrated, I think clearly, of the uh, terrible uh, destructive uh, capacity that uh, we now have, and that uh, it ended, or helped end, uh, end this war, but it's also a, a warning that uh, there better not be a World War III. I'm not sure what innocent civilians are. I think people like Rosie the Riveter are far from innocent civilians, and I know that the population around military centers, or in the case of Nagasaki, around plants that were producing torpedoes and things, work in the plants and turn out the weapons of war. And someplace along that spectrum, innocence must disappear. It's a force building up to, a, to an atomic confrontation, that can't happen, it must not happen, but I, that's a feeling that I came away, even though I wasn't involved in the drop, certainly just the bombing raids in which I participated should never have to occur again in this world as we know it. And that's, that's what time has taught me. You really can't expect people to be able to view things now as they did in 45. Uh, but I can expect them to be able to use common sense and so forth which the revisionistic people are simply are not doing. Uh, in 45, there was ex extreme patriotism. My, one of my principal goals was to do what I could to help and get home and to help others get home. I see none of that. It, it is, is impossible for that to be understood now. We wanted to be the best of the best and we, we, we did that. We were fighting uh, to a degree that I think no young person today can begin to understand. 
against forces that would have set back uh, civilization as we know it by hundreds of years. If Hitler and Mussolini and uh, the Japanese military regime had been able to, to win the war, we would have seen this, this uh, civilized world as we have known it plunged into uh, sort of a glorified prison camp in many ways. If we had lost that war, we would have lost far more than just uh, the struggle itself.